Hello everyone, my name is Adam, and welcome into this week's trip down the homeward path. Before we get into things, I've got a few questions. Are you a fan of Magic the Gathering? Presumably so, since you're here listening to a podcast about it, but, you know, what do I know? But is there something else in your life that takes precedence? keeps you away from your magical aspirations, a job, a career, partner, spouse, children, any and all of the above. Listen, I'm right there with you. I have a wonderful wife, three children, full-time job, and a lot of extracurricular commitments that make it really difficult to devote the amount of time, finance, and energy that high-level competitive magic normally takes. But in spite of that, are you, like me, relentlessly seeking improvement every time you get a chance to play? If that sounds like something you're interested in, then I suggest you hop in and buckle up. Now let's go for a ride. But it's a good time to remind you that we are brought to you by the following sponsors. PureMTGO.com is one of the largest depositories of magic content on the web. They've got a little bit of something for absolutely everyone. And I do mean everyone. So head over there, check out their collection of stuff. While you're at it, I understand that the arena grind can feel like a bit of a slog, especially if, like me, you're traditionally at least a free-to-play player. But thanks to our sponsor at Grey Viking Games, you don't have to wander the wilderness in search of your glory on your own. You can head over there and find access to pre-release codes, single pack codes, cosmetics, promo packs, uh, card sleeves, any and all of the above. So go and find your glory at grayvikinggames.com and if you want to support this show in a much more direct fashion don't forget to head over to patreon.com slash homewardpathmtg this show is always going to be free but if you like what we're doing enough to help us keep doing it go over, become a patron and take advantage of your rewards and if you've got questions, comments or concerns about the show or you just want to talk you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Homeward Path MTG. You can find me on Facebook. My name is Adam Spain, like the country. Yes, I got picked on about that for most of my life. And you can join the conversation in the Facebook group, the Homeward Pathfinders. So head over, check all that stuff out while you continue to listen on the homeward path hello everybody we are a little late this week we had uh i'm not going to say a busy weekend it was just not a conducive weekend to any sort of content creation so with that in mind let's dive in first segment budget spotlight and given that it is mardu week we're going to be looking at some red white and black cards First and foremost, our red card for the week is Relic Robber. Now, Relic Robber is a 3-mana, 2-2 haste. Uh, When it deals combat damage to a player, that player creates a 0-1 goblin token that cannot block. It's an artifact goblin token that cannot block. And that token has, at the beginning of upkeep, this creature deals 1 damage to you. So, this thing is the newest hasty value damage red 3 drop. And that's like a mouthful, but it's like a whole creature archetype. From stuff like Rabble Master to Legion War Boss, now we have Relic Robber. It's a 3 drop that scales up in damage every turn that you're allowed to untap with it. And notably, with this one, the, diff- the key difference between this one and, like, Rabble Master and Legion War Boss is the fact that if the opponent can't sweep the board, 
the value from this thing lingers. Even if they kill it, they're still taking damage from the tokens. Because it's not like Rabble Master, it's not like War Boss in the sense that they can't just kill the creature and then block the token. Because the damage isn't coming from more attacks. The extra damage is coming from stuff that's sitting on their side of the field. So if they can't get rid of stuff on their own side of the field profitably, this thing can cause some headaches for people. And, I mean, what more do you want from your value hasty three drop? That only costs you 50 cents. I think we can do a lot worse. I don't know about you. So, moving to red's allied color. Mardu, of course, is base red. Red's allied color is black. And the card I want to talk about for black is Hunted Nightmare. Hunted Nightmare is one double black. So, one black black buys you a 4-5 with Menace. The downside to it being, when this creature enters the battlefield, a target opponent puts a death touch counter on a creature they control. So, first and foremost, this is the second most power and toughness for its mana cost in standard. Trailing only Lovestruck Beast. And we all know how difficult that thing is to get off the table. If I'm not mistaken, I've talked about this card before, but I don't remember having talked about it, so I need to talk about it again. Because it's even better than that. It's just really, really good. If you've got enough removal in your deck, you don't care about the fact that their creature has Death Touch. Full stop. Give it to a 1-1, follow it up with Spike Field Hazard. Give it to a big creature... Kill it with a Blood Chief's Thirst, or kill it with a Heartless, or not a Heartless Act, but, you know, get them to block, use Heartless Act to remove the, the counter. Still functions as a removal spell. <laughs> Give this thing a Death Touch counter, because it's got Menace. It forces them to block with two creatures. If they block enough to kill it, you can use Death Touch to trade. It's the kind of card that, like, seems really unassuming... But, for example, when you play it in the sideboard of your control decks, or you play it in the sideboard of your uh, mid-range decks that are reactive, that have just, you know, chock full of removal, it's got some legs, and not just the ones it gives to your opponent's creatures. And again, it only costs you 50 cents for a 3-drop 4-5 that they have to have two creatures to block. That's a lot of pressure to put on your opponent. Moving on, our white card this week is a rarity in the sense that it's not rare, it's an uncommon. See what I did there? <laughs> uh, the card in question is Clarion Spirit from Kaldheim. It's one and a white and says... Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, create a 1-1 one, one spirit token. It's the latest young Pyromancer variant. Like, we've seen a ton of these over the years, right? We had the original young Pyromancer. Peasy. Makes games easy. We had uh, Hero Precinct 1. Now we have this. You know, we had Improbable Alliance, which technically you can play alongside this, but, you know, these these two-drop threats that generate incremental value turn after turn after turn, continually putting more and more power and toughness on the board every time you take a certain game action. It's a Spell Slinger payoff, and this time it's a white card. We can do worse than that. We can do a lot worse than that. So in the case of Clarion Spirit, it's currently held in check by Bonecrusher Giant. That's one of the biggest things keeping this card from being very, very, very good in standard, is the fact that Bonecrusher Giant exists. Having said that, it's going to outlast Bonecrusher Giant in standard. Bonecrusher Giant rotates next October and may or may not get banned before then, depending on how the format shakes out. Clarion Spirit is unlikely 
to have a problem in either of those categories. It is unlikely to, you know, be forced out. It's definitely not going to get rotated early. And it's almost certainly not going to get banned. Because it's the kind of card like Hero Precinct 1 that's just pretty good. Having said that, the other interesting aspect to Clarion Spirit is while it's got some playability now, with the the advent of the Spirit support in Strixhaven, which has not really been explored very heavily, this thing might get better. And I don't mean a little bit better. I mean like a lot better. Like a lot, lot better. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter whose turn you're casting the spells on. If you're casting two spells on either player's turn, you're making another token. So, similar to trying to do the workaround with uh, Improbable Alliance, it's not hard to make this into a make a token on both players' turns thing. Just like Young Pyromancer. It's a little bit harder than Young Pyromancer. But not being limited to instant and sorcery and being able to surround it with enough cheap removal, disruption, card draw, cantrips, uh, counter magic. Like, there's no specific archetype of spell that you have to play alongside this, which is really neat. And it costs you the grand total of a quarter. Budget spotlights, really spotlighting the budget stuff this week. Let me tell you. And last but not least, because we haven't spent enough money this week. Ruinous Ultimatum. Because we got to do a Mardu card. And this is the most Mardu card that ever Mardu. Its mana cost is red, red, white, 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 black, black. And it reads... Destroy all non-land permanents your opponents control. That's it. That's the whole card. Seven mana. Kill all your stuff. Now we normally reserve this slot for commander playable stuff. And that's definitely something this card is. It is definitely a commander playable card to say the least. I would argue that it's a borderline staple in any deck that can support its mana cost. Because it just, I mean, kills everything. And last time I checked, killing everything is very good. Whether you're playing 60 cards or, or 100. It's, in, to, to put it in perspective, one of the cards that sees a ton of play, or at least used to see a ton of play in Commander, is Plague Wind. Destroy all creatures you don't control. They can't be regenerated. Plague Wind costs 9 mana. This thing costs 7 mana and gets all their mana rocks and enchantments and nonsense. It, it's, it's Plague Wind, but it's better and it's cheaper. Really? I mean, I guess they had to give Mardu something, right? But it's also not just limited to Commander. A really good example of where this card can shine in 60 card formats is when you look at something like the various forms of Fires decks in Pioneer. Where if you're playing either Fey of Wishes or Masterminds Acquisition, you can actually just go get this with Fires of Invention up and be able to cast it right away to nuke the opponent's board. Whether you're getting it off Fey of Wishes or Mastermind's Acquisition is irrelevant. The fact that you can go get a oops, blow your stuff up is really strong. So it's a really strong option to have in the sideboard of your decks that are playing Wishes. So that's going to wrap it up for Budget Spotlight. Let's move on. And this, I have to preface this by pointing out, this is very much in the rough core concept stage. Similar to last week, arguably more similar, more than more than last week, this deck is still very much in a theory crafting state, but I wanted to throw the idea out there for anybody who might be interested. Our brew of the week this week is Mardu Showdown. 
in standard. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. The core concept is you are a reactive mid-range deck predicated on making mana-efficient one-for-one trades, just like every Mardu mid-range deck you can think of that's ever existed in the history of time. That's what you're here to do if you're playing Mardu mid-range. Trade one-for-one and find a way to grind, right? Well, in this case, your grinding engine is Showdown of the Scalds and Shepherd of the Flock. Showing other skulls, being able to exile your top four cards, I believe it is. And then until the end of your next turn, you can play them. And the chapter two of the saga is whenever you cast a spell this turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on on target creature you control. Combined with Shepherd of the Flock, the adventure half of Shepherd of the Flock allows you to bounce a permanent to your hand. So you can exile four cards with Showdown. Untap, cast a couple of them, play the land that you almost inevitably hit, and then play the Shepherd of the Flock ability to bounce it back to your hand to reset to keep going. And if you've got removal in there or you've got threats in there, you can just keep valuing your opponent. You get the best adventure creature because you're playing red, so you get Bone Crusher Giant. Which also helps apply pressure because we need to. You get the best escape creatures if you want them in Croxa and Ox of Agonis. You know, you can... There's a lot of flexibility that comes with this this archetype. And then you also get tons of cheap interaction. Because we got a lot of stuff from Silver Quill in Strixhaven... And we've had a lot of stuff from Orzov and Rakdos and Boros, or Lorehold, which also got additional cheap removal in Strixhaven. So from a customization standpoint, what is there not to customize with this deck? Just kidding. The basic premise of the deck comes down to how you want to play. Do you want to go over or do you want to go under? Going under. Over the top places an emphasis on value exchanges in the mid game, opens up Yorian as a companion, and it grant which grants you in turn more ways to abuse Showdown of the Skulls. A going over the top variation of the deck, a Mardu Yorian deck that's playing Showdown, Shepherd, you know, value exchanges and cards like Omen of the Forge, uh, End of the Battlefield effects, Elspeth Conquers Death, that kind of stuff. Is less interested in extracting the maximum value out of Showdown. And more interested in just hitting land drops and letting Showdown find you powerful cards. You treat it much more like a card selection spell than you do a card draw spell. Which is par for the course when you're playing 80 cards. If you're going under, you probably want a leaner curve. Maybe even going as far as to as to have your curve topped by Rankle at four mana. Rankle and or uh, Liliana, Waker of the Dead, to give you on board turn after turn hand disruption that your opponent has to interact with. The more I think about it, the more I lean toward Liliana there. Because of the synergy with Shepard and the fact that Liliana provides an additional win condition where Rankle, like, dies to all the good red removal. But your emphasis with going under, if you're keeping the curve lean, is casting as many of the spells as you can that you hit on showdown you don't want a lot of three drops you don't want a lot of four drops you want mostly ones and twos and even within this framework between main deck and sideboard there's a lot of different directions to go because you've got the disruption angle you've got a lot of cards that allow you to rip cards out of your opponent's hand in these three colors 
you've got Croxa, you've got agonizing remorse or agonizing, yeah, agonizing remorse. You've got uh, the new two drop thing that I can't remember what does. Uh, the two drop thing that makes him discard a card when it is a battlefield. Sorry, brain short circuited on me. Or you can take the leaner curve and make the deck more aggressive. For example, you can go Triome or Snowland on one, Robber of the Rich on two, Relic Robber on three, Rankle on four, and your opponent is in an absolute world of hurt. Strictly speaking, you can do that in just Rakdos. But then you get the benefit of having Showdown plus Shepard to grind you through once they wipe the board. Once they inevitably wipe the board, because of course they're going to wipe the board. And a firm middle ground can be achieved if you play the aforementioned Hunted Nightmare in your deck. Which is to say, you're presumably playing lots of removal or and or disruption. So, Hunted Nightmare alongside all of this has got some real legs. In sideboarding, there's a ton of disruption available in these colors, as well as some outright quote-unquote floodgates. Cards like Dronith Magistrate or Kunaros from uh, Theros Beyond Death that locks them out of casting spells or putting creatures into play from the graveyard. You've got a you know Dranith Magistrate that keeps them from casting adventure spells. Because once they cast the, the spell half, they can't play things from not their hand. Which also locks out opposing showdown decks, which also locks out uh, anything that allows you to cast cards out of the top of your library. Whatever the case may be. It's very, very effective. Now, as for the outlook on this concept, if fair magic is good post Strixhaven, and I wrote this episode before Strixhaven released, before we got an idea of what the format was going to look like and the fact that uh, Strixhaven cards are not making a massive impact on Standard, but they are matriculating in here and there. But if fair magic is good post Strixhaven... This will give you a chance. It gives you the ability in a 75 card configuration in a best of three match, you get to steer the direction of what the game is about. And when we're talking about a deck that wants to make the opponent play fair magic, that's really all we're looking for. It's pretty much it. So moving on, continuing our color series, our color pair, color grouping series. This week, who in the heck are the Mardu Horde? Well, in the lore, they're a clan of warriors and marauders clearly establishing their core color red and its relationship with ally black and enemy white. The dragon aspect that the Mardu admired obviously being the, the tales of the ancient dragons and in the original timeline, though the clans eventually hunted down and killed the dragons, they admired aspects of their the ancient versions of them that were more powerful. They admired the ancient dragon aspect of speed. Basing their social hierarchy on them in the main timeline. To the point that, like, they hunted down and killed the dragons. But hunting down and killing powerful foes, hunting down and killing more dragons, was a badge of honor. It was a, a rite of passage for the Mardu warrior. It was the basis of their social hierarchy. You were only as good as the prey that you could defeat. And then the timeline changed. Sarkin changed the timeline by saving Ugin's life. 
which meant the dragons never went away, in fact, appeared in much larger numbers and greater power. And one of them, the Dragon Lord Kolagon, eventually became the leader of what was left of the Mardu. Really fun fact, from a representation standpoint, Mardu is the home clan of Magic's first openly trans character, Alesha, who smiles at death, who is one of my favorite commanders. I'm just going to throw that out there. Any game I've ever played against an opponent wielding Alesha has been fun. Their main timeline mechanic, Raid, symbolizes the aggressive nature of the clan, basing the strategy around attacking. Cards that have Raid on them give you some kind of benefit, either something you can do with mana or, you know, the ability to return a creature from your graveyard to your hand. Whatever the case may be, it's all based around the idea that you've attacked. It's a mechanic that was sort of revisited in Ixalan for the pirates. Very similar. They didn't use the keyword, but they made the strategy around attacking. Aggressive attacking. The new timeline mechanic, Dash, is a less comical rendition of one of my favorite cards in all of Magic, which is the rocket-powered Turbo Slug from Unhinged. Creatures with Dash, you can pay a mana cost to put them onto the battlefield with haste, and then after the combat phase, they'll return to your hand, or at the beginning of the next end step, they'll return to your hand. It's a less comical and has a much less negative drawback to the super haste of rocket-powered turbo slug. But it was really cool to see what was essentially a, a joke mechanic reworked and made into a very real one that had some applications. I thought it was really cool. Outside of Tarkir, Mardu colors tend to draw in one of two directions. Reactive mid-range decks or synergy-based aggro decks. And to prove that point, let's dive into my competitive history with Mardu. The first honorable mention is Fire Main Control, is what I called the deck, in Time Spiral Standard. I sought to control games with a bevy of one-for-one -one card exchanges and use Phyrexian Arena to catch up, with Fire Main Angel serving as inevitability. I never really got to tune this deck because I was a broke high school kid that didn't work and my parents did not want to spend hundreds of dollars on cardboard. So I did not have access to shock lands in my first go round in standard. It's just a sad truth. It is what it is. It's part of the reason I played the combo deck that had all basic lands in it during Kamigawa Ninth or Kamigawa Ravnica Ninth Edition Standard is because I couldn't afford good lands. <laughs> it was a budget handicap I had to work around, and it was unfortunate, but it was the truth. It was, it was what I was doing. But it was a deck with cards like uh, Mortify, Lightning Helix, uh, Wrath of God to help catch up, Castigate to take problem cards out of my opponent's hand. Uh, the theory, the overall theory of the deck felt solid, but I could never get it to perform because my mana would always mess up. I was playing a bunch of signets and stuff to try to fix the mana, and then I just didn't have room for other good cards. And I think if the mana had not been an issue, it would have potentially been a contender. So moving on, it was actually not until I took my hiatus and came back that I really encountered a good Mardu deck. Although I am saving my favorite one in, in retrospect, one of my favorite ones I've ever researched for last. But the first one I really got to play with, the first one I really got to do anything with, was Mardu Vehicles in Kaladesh, from Kaladesh to Dominaria Standard. All the way through that whole year. 
the whole two years, the whole time, all of that was legal and standard at the same time. It was originally postured as the only viable aggro deck when Kaladesh first released. Like, this was it. This was the only one you got. You got Smuggler's Copter, Gideon Ally of Zendikar, uh, the litany of good red and white cards to the point that a lot of people were not playing black or were only splashing black for the activation cost on Scrap Heap Scrounger. Cards like Bomat Courier were very good in the deck. But Smuggler's Copter got banned. And after Smuggler's Copter got banned, the deck took on much more of kind of the traditional big aggro approach. Which is to say, when people started trying to play stuff like uh, Winding Constrictor, started trying to play stuff like Stompy or Mono Red, so on and so forth, this was the deck that tried to go over the top of them but still stay under other mid-range and control decks. Because it turns out Heart of Kirin is a heck of a magic card. I don't know how many of y'all knew that, but uh, it is. definitely is. And when you combine Heart of Kirin with a bunch of three power and up creatures, Toolcraft Exemplar, uh, Unlicensed Disintegration, this was one of the only things that stood in the way of the absolute, complete and utter dominance of the four-color copycat deck was the fact that this deck could just curve out and kill you on turn five. Pretty reliably, I might add. So the copycat deck could not combo off. The, the, the copycat deck could not try to just go for turn four combo because you would frequently just annihilate them while they were trying. They were forced to play a reactive game. Uh, creatures like... Thalia Heretic Cathar did a good job shutting that deck down. Walking Ballista being able to ping the Sahili in response to the trigger from the uh, Felidar Guardian. And then the way the old Planeswalker redirection rule worked allowed Unlicensed Disintegration to break the entire combo because you could kill the Felidar Guardian and redirect the three damage to Sahili and kill it. So it was, it was just a deck that did a really, really critical job during its time in Standard. It was, it was very good. And it also, it lasted all the way up. Like, Gideon Ally of Zendikar rotated. Some of the other cards that made it palatable to a lot of the masses rotated out of Standard. Good and bad matchups got banned. And this deck endured all of that. Like, it stuck around and kept putting up numbers, putting up results. So it's a testament to me to the power of Kaladesh Block that through multiple formats, multiple years of Magic, this deck was good the whole time. It may not have been the best deck the whole time, but it was playable, it was good, it was viable the whole time. Next on the list is Mardu Pyromancer for Modern. And I have it, this deck is the one that finally broke Bedlam Reveler, a card that I desperately tried to play and make good before, but ultimately shelved every deck that I tried to put it into in favor of something better. This is the epitome of a pay-me-off for playing Fair Magic Archetype. You married Disruption and Removal to Bedlam Reveler and Faithless Looting. Faithless Looting is less card advantage and more card selection. It allowed you to find the cards you wanted rather than, like, actually go up on cards. And 
it created a solid platform for fair, honest magic. And it's a deck I have a long, a long standing history with. It's a deck that I love to play, but I'm horrible with. But I'm working on it. Next on the list is Mardu Ascend. And this was really kind of a one tournament deck, but I really wanted to highlight the synergy aggro aspect of Mardu. And this was one of the best ways I could. Mardu Ascend was a synergy aggro deck from Grand Prix Memphis in 2018, I believe it was. It was basically mono white aggro. It was technically mono white aggro. Not going to sugarcoat it. It, it released before Dominaria did. You know, this, this deck debuted before Dominaria did. And it was playing a lot of the cards that would end up helping to define Dominaria mono white aggro. But it was playing creatures like the ubiquitous Tollcraft Exemplar, uh, Snubhorn Sentry, Bomat Courier and Scrap Heap Scrounger were splashed for activation costs, and then you had some cards you could cheat into after sideboarding. But the cool thing about it is, like, it was the deck that made Pride of Conquerors good. It was a, it was a little bit of an overwhelming surprise for that event because players were so pigeonholed and focused on beating Mono Red and the Grixis Energy decks that this deck got to just come in and run over some people who just weren't playing enough removal. So I thought that was a really good example of a highlight of a synergy aggro deck that just found a, you know, threaded the eye of the needle and found the perfect tournament to exist in. And last but not least, we have the Aristocrats from Innistrad Return to Ravnica Standard. Full disclosure, I did not play the standard format. This was during my break. But it's one of my favorite decks I've ever seen in researching Magic. I have here, I said, it's often imitated, never duplicated. This serves as a mesh point of everything you want to do in Mardu. The Aristocrats and Doom Traveler gave the deck a synergy engine to beat down with. You know, the uh, Falconrath Aristocrat was a was a 4-1 Cartel Aristocrat was two power. Both of them notoriously difficult to kill if you had anything to feed to them. So they allowed you to apply pressure. That same engine coupled with Boros Reckoner gave it a grind game because you could just make advantageous creature blocks. You could force trades. You could block with Falcon Wrath Aristocrat, make a sacrifice, give it protection, kill their creature. It was really, really good. And then it also, on top of all of that, it had the, the synergy aggro aspect. It was built around grinding. And then it also just had this oops, I win button of being able to play Boros Reckoner and Blasphemous Act in the same deck. Which is to say you would get a bunch of creatures on the board. The board state would get clogged up and get kind of muddy. And then you just go Reckoner, Blasphemous Act, kill everything 13 you. Ew. I said it kind of completes the trifecta of games this deck can win. If an opponent's playing too reactively, your aristocrats can get under them, beat down, deal some damage, and then you have Reckoner or the, the Reckoner Blasphemous Act package to fall back on to close it out. If you're in a mid-range game, you you have infinite chump blockers between your token makers, your aristocrats, your reckoner that can create two-for-one trades. Just, I mean, it's it's the perfect encapsulation of everything Mardu, and I love it. And with that, that's that's really all I got. That that's all I got for this week. So if you've got questions, you've got comments, you've got concerns, you can leave them down below in the comment section. You can send them to me on Twitter. I'm at HomewardPathMTG. You can send them to me on Facebook. My name is Adam Spain. 
You can join the conversation in the Facebook group, the Homeward Pathfinders. If you're a patron, you obviously get access to the Patron Pathfinders Discord, where we talk about episode topics. Frequently, I end up enlisting help for stuff like Budget Spotlight or Brew of the Week. And obviously, if you're a patron of $5 or more, you get access to the, the having your very own episode written just for you. So, there's that. Uh, but with that in mind, I'm trying to get it to pull up. <laughs> uh, with that in mind, it's time to move on to my favorite segment every week. Hashtag... MTG dad jokes. And I know we've got some. I know we do. Which, okay, it's on the right network. There it is. Did I do that one? I did that one. I got one. <laughs> and it's from Brad by way of Shivam Bot. Shivam says, I made a typo and now I want to open a fish restaurant called Kiora Based the Seafood. First of all, I would definitely eat there. Somebody says Embra Culinary Delights. <laughs> oh, what else we got? Oh, we got another one. If I were wealthy, I'd open a burger joint and gaming lounge called the Woo Burger. <laughs> to which Brad said, goes great with fries of Yavamai. <laughs> I kind of want to try to make fries of Yavamaya now, Brad. <laughs> I really do appreciate it. Look, we all need something to laugh at right now. Everybody's going through stuff. Everybody's got something going on. So with that in mind, in dealing with people, I leave you with the same parting words I do every every episode, most episodes. I've forgotten the last few. Never be cruel. Never be cowardly. Remember, hate is always foolish. Love is always wise. Always try to be nice, but never fail to be kind. So, laugh hard. Play fair magic. Be kind. We'll catch you next episode. Be safe, everybody.